uh, in the broadest possible manner, both as a fictional story as well as what we call the factual story or even the new story. So the question that we began with is, what is it that compels a reader's attention? That's the question we asked ourselves. As you can imagine, the fictional story and the factual story share a lot in common. Professor Maya and I will each speak for about 15 minutes or so, and the floor will then be uh, thrown open for uh, discussion. I'll begin by talking to you about what makes for a really good fictional story, um, because I think that's the genre I know best. I'll focus on two most important aspects of fiction writing, because clearly we can't do it all in, in, in 20 minutes. So uh, let me uh, sort of share screen. I do have a set of slides prepared, and uh, I'll go a little slow. So, uh, you know, you'll get a close uh, get. Is it visible to everybody? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on uh, this evening is uh, these two aspects of uh, what constitutes a really good story, uh, the art of description and detailing, and uh, the whole idea that you need to really uh, draw on the very rich treasure trove that is memory when you write uh, fiction. Right? Because we often ask, uh, ask ourselves as beginners, how do we go about even identifying what uh, you know, material we should turn into a story, right? We don't often have faith in ourselves to be able to generate material for a good story. So I'll, uh, so I thought it's important to really focus on that. So broadly speaking, uh, these are the five elements uh, of good fiction, of fiction itself, plot, setting, point of view, dialogue, and character. So what two of the, you know, most important aspects of telling a great story, uh, according to me and according to many others who write who are writers is the ability uh, that we all have to observe the present moment, to describe it, the art of detailing, uh, especially when it comes to uh, setting, plot and character in a story, right? So it's also equally important uh, to sort of take one's own life experience seriously uh, and to say that, yes, it's okay to draw on our own uh, memories and our own experiences in the past and identify from that what holds meaning in order to develop a good plot or an interesting character. Right? Uh, and I can't emphasize this enough because I know a lot of um, uh, you know beginning writers actually worry about this. You know, they often come to me and say, you know, how do I identify the theme for a, identify the plot or the theme for a good story? And I tell them it's really within yourself and it's it's within your own life. Uh, world and, and your own universe, both in terms of your past as well as in terms of where you find yourself in the present, right? So things like point of view and dialogue feed into and support all the other elements of uh, fiction. So that is something that uh, we might just maybe talk about briefly during the Q&A session, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So what does it mean to really observe the present moment? Right? It's easy to say that, but what do we do? Uh, you know, our, our lives are so harried, so hurried. We all lead incredibly anxious, um, tense lives, right? So it's very important if you want to be a writer, any kind of writer, to build in moments of pause. Right? To tell yourself, it's all right. Life is not going to pass me by. Let me just stand still or sit still and observe the present moment, right? It's a little bit like what the Buddhists tell me. Uh, it's also important to learn to look at the familiar world differently, right? So I'm uh, not sure how many of your students, but when I was a student, I used to take the same road down from my hospital to the, to the department, right? The same road every day, day in and day out for about three years, four years, whatever. Right? And then it just becomes part of the familiar and I stopped noticing what, what was on it, right? If there was a butterfly, I wouldn't notice a butterfly. I would just say, okay, I need to get to class by 9 a.m. or what. So being a writer means to be able to build in moments of pause, to also look at the same, uh, you know, your own daily routine, your own daily surroundings differently, to be able to develop a sharp eye for details, to ask yourself, what is it that you're really looking at, right? And then how would you describe it so that it sounds interesting to others, yeah? And let me also assure you that however dull you might think your lives are at the moment, uh, maybe you're a housewife, maybe you're 
you're uh, just working at the same job um, year after year, or maybe you're a student going to the same department for the last three years or so, right? Uh, so you may say, you know, what's so interesting about that? I don't think my life is interesting. It's such a dull life. But I think the challenge as a writer for you, if you're going to sort of mine your own experience to write a story, is to say, ask yourself the question, you know, what is it that's the detail in my life that's interesting? And how do I go about describing it to somebody else so that it sounds interesting to them? Yeah, that's, that's the challenge for us. Right? So writing is really a sensory art. It's a perceptual art. It's a process of um, becoming aware of opening up the senses to ways of grasping the world, uh, ways that may have been previously been completely blocked, right? It happens to all of us when we lead, um, you know, busy lives. So not to be caught up in that busyness of us, uh, of our lives, but to be, uh, to force those pauses in our lives. I think is very, very important. So one thing um, I, I noticed as a writer in my own life is that we tend to take the world around us for, for granted, right? And all our lives, as I've just said, contain degrees of routine, you know? So you wake up at the same time, perhaps, you wake up at 7 a.m., you, you, the first thing you do is you brush your teeth, you have a shower, you do the same things in the same way, you know, minimum decision fatigue, as they say, right? And you get into a bus or a car or you walk to work or college or whatever it is, right? And it's just that routine, the sameness of our lives. But Here's the thing, that same routine can be made up your interesting in poems and stories. Ask yourself, what is the drama around here in that routine? What is the internal drama? What is the setting like? What does the kitchen look like to you, right? What does the light look like as it streams in through the kitchen window? Does it look different, right? Uh, what is the bird that's making a call outside my, uh, my this house in which I'm sort of literally, uh, uh, you know, stuck all day, right? So a writer's task is to build a world for the reader. Yeah. So in and that's it's only on that world that the plot, uh, you know, then takes that takes shape. It's from that. Right? <coughs> so in order to make that world interesting, as a writer, your duty is to make sure that you see the thing that you do day in and day out through different eyes. Yeah. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. It's something that I think needs some practice. But it also needs a degree of faith in yourself to be able to see that world differently yeah yeah and and the second thing here uh kind of connected really is the art of uh figuring out what it is that is the telling detail so it is not just any detail that you as a writer should look out for but what we call the telling detail the important or the significant detail that that is perhaps a dramatic moment in, in what's happening around you right uh, so I'll, I'll give you a little example. So if you have, uh, in fact, this actually happened uh, to me. I was shopping for groceries and it's a very, it's a chore that I don't particularly enjoy that, but we have to do it, of course, every week or whatever, right? But, and I was at the checkout counter and there was this uh, person in front of me, a man, a fairly large built man, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and I was just like really being very mindless and a little bit annoyed that I had to wait in line and all that. Then I noticed that his cart contained, you know, uh, lots of packets of chips and several cans of Coke. And I judged him a little, though I know I shouldn't, saying, okay, here's this person. He's not in great shape, but he's actually just shopping for chips and Coke, right? He shouldn't be doing this. And, and what happened after that was really a small, tiny, dramatic moment, which is he opened his purse, his wallet, and uh, to pay, and he dropped his gym membership card. And then I said, okay, so this is... This is his life. And there's that character for you. Here is somebody perhaps who's trying to get in shape, but he's he's shopping for this. So that's it's kind of at odds, right? So you can actually use that as a germ for a for a story. There's a plot there already, right? So just an example, but I'm saying that's the kind of thing you need to keep an eye out for, right? No life is boring. Yeah. Even your most routine chore of shopping for a for groceries at the supermarket isn't boring if you only know what to look for. Yeah. So uh you know, you might want to ask yourself, right? Uh, do you really, so the telling detail also means that you filter out or you leave out unimportant, dull, boring details, yeah? So ask yourself, do you really need to know what your characters had to be? Is that important? Maybe it is. Maybe it's important for some particular reason, right? Uh, ask, uh, do you want to really ask yourself, uh, just tell the reader, you know, what color their bath mat is, yeah? Is it a telling detail you need to? kind of ask. So make sure you focus your reader's eyes on what are these important details. Right. 
so just imagine uh, i sort of cooked this up uh, on the spur of the moment but if this were to be the opening paragraph of a short story or a novel right then we woke up at 6 am as usual headed to the bathroom she used a pink food brush on her teeth used lux soap to wash her face she made herself a cup of really strong black coffee set it out to drink it as she sipped her coffee she read the newspaper she read about the latest movies in town she then proceeded to make herself some toast which she downed with another cup of really strong black coffee after this it was time for a bath with lux soap again clad in a lemon yellow kurta she set off to yeah so the thing here is uh, i'm sure you all have noticed this already that there is a tremendous amount of detail right the time at which she woke up what color of the toothbrush what brand of soap she used was her coffee strong or not right all of that right and what she had for breakfast uh, what she read in the newspaper and what she wore right do we really you need to ask yourself as a writer of this given that you know you think ahead about the plot right ask yourself what is the telling detail right maybe it might be the pink toothbrush because you want to sort of build on it later in the story always make sure the details that you use right have a reason to be there right so the pink toothbrush ought to have some kind of significance to the story or the lux soap ought to have some kind of emotional significance in the story that you connect to later yeah so this is all this is another little little micro lesson right on writing a good story so let's look at uh, a master storyteller uh, spot chris jerrin uh, who's um, you know very very well known uh, uh, novel novel actually called the great gatsby uh, you know is is and he celebrated now actually so this is a scene from uh, one of the uh, from from the novel where uh, the protagonist gatsby who is a millionaire bootlegger is reunited with his lost love whose name is daisy and he starts off by showing off to her his uh, you know huge opulent house and all this possessions and this is a little excerpt from that uh, he took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them one by one before us shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many colored disarray while they admired he brought more and the soft rich heap mounted higher shirts with stripes and scrolls and played in coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange with monograms of indian blue suddenly with a strange sound daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily they are such beautiful shirts she saw her voice muffled in the thick folds it makes me sad because i've never seen such such beautiful shirts before right so <clears throat> one of the things you notice about that passage is that there's a series of uh, very complex visual textual prompts that create a certain image in our minds that gives an impact right it's very rich sen sen sensory richness right so <clears throat> there's a lot of impact that the details have the thick folds the sheer linen the fine flannel the the heap the soft rich heap the coral the apple green and there's an extravagance in the way the pile of shirts becomes larger here we are talking about a millionaire right we're talking about somebody who's trying to show off yeah so the details connect to who he is what he is like yeah and daisy is very dramatic response she begins to sob right and it actually also fits the mood and the tone of the wealthy new york crowd that fits the and trying to satirize in that so it has there's a reason why all of these things happen in that passage right those details are there for a reason there is an emotional um, connect that uh, response that daisy the other character has to also right so also we we then ask ourselves what is such what is such an opulent wardrobe tell us about gatsby's character it tells us something why is he showing daisy all his possessions yeah and while we admired he brought, he brought more that 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 line suggests that the shirts only have value for gatsby when others are admiring them otherwise they are useless and that's that's how it is with we know that right uh, things often acquire value because somebody else looks at us and says oh wow you you own that kind of a car or oh, oh wow you have this kind of a job right it's nothing internal it's always often external right so the thing is the trick is to come back to what i was just saying in the beginning is to pin your writing down to very specific uh, detail not to use bland or vague adjectives to avoid words like nice good dark bad use it but use it sparingly only use metaphor if it is pertinent and really surprising develop a sensory understanding of the world of um, perfume sounds textures taste and of course 
in connection to that, you need to develop a vocabulary for that, which is perhaps not always easy, uh, but you need to do it if you want to be a daily worker. Yeah. So develop also the ability to take a moment and to split it into its component parts. You know, uh, what was it that a character or a person that you remember from, from the past? What was it that he or she was wearing? How did they look? How did they gesture, right? Ask yourself how you can subvert expectations, right? And when it comes to dialogue, for instance, that you get the characters to speak, different people would describe the same scene or object differently, right? So you can play with that, is what I'm, I'm trying, trying to say, yeah? Uh, okay, so here's another uh, novel by you know, this writer Muriel Spark, uh, Memento Mori, published in 1959. It means, remember, you must, you must die. Right, uh, and the title is it's basically the message which is delivered by a series of insidious phone calls made to this very elderly person, Nettie Colston, in her acquaintances. So we ask ourselves who's making the calls and why, and the recipients, each of the recipients of these phone calls reflects on their past life and while they are trying to identify the culprit. Right, and so this is just an excerpt from that, which I'm giving you as an example of how do you show, for instance, uh, a character's age, right? So I thought this is a very good example of that. And again, boils down to what kind of detail do you put in, right? Let tell me. Shamian made her way to the library and cautiously built up the fire which had burned low. The effort of stooping tired her and she sat for a moment in the big chair. After a while, it was tea time. She thought for a space about tea. Mrs. Pettigrew had, had gone out. Shamian felt overwhelmed suddenly with trepidation and pleasure. Could she make tea herself? Yes, she would try. The kettle was heavy as she held it under the tap. It was heavier still when it was half filled with water. It rocked in her hand and her skinny, large, freckled wrist ate and wobbled with the string. So you can, uh, you can just uh, make out from this little passage that just the fact that, you know, even the kettle, right? Uh, she finds it really hard to hold it, yeah? Uh, even that, and even the effort of stooping tires her tells us about her age. You don't need to know that she's 83 or 87. The age doesn't have to be mentioned, right? Showing what a character's age is. It's easy enough to do that. So this is uh, really just an example from that. And I'll uh, sort of, uh, you know, I think I'm kind of running out of time, but basically just to, I'll just leave you with this uh, little passage uh, and, and just to say that it's very important to um, actually raid your past, yeah, to look for sensorial detail. It's a very, very important resource for writers. And here's a little excerpt from Leslie Glester's memory, the true key to real uh, imagining. So let me let me just, uh, uh, you know, sort of pull that out for you. And uh, can you all see this, screen share? You see the PDF? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Okay, I'll just read the first passage for you and I, I don't want to take any more time. So this uh, is from... Sorry, we don't see the PDF. We are just oh. seeing the slides. You're just seeing the slides. Is it okay? Yeah. Just give me a moment. I'll uh, probably I need to. I think I need to do screen share again. Yeah, this is clear now. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just leave you with this uh, passage uh, where uh, Leslie Blaster, uh, and this is from a piece titled Memory, the True Key to Real Imagining, talks about, uh, yeah, you'll see what, what, uh, talks, what she talks about. So, I'm on a beach. I don't know where. South Wall, perhaps. I'm very small and wearing a blue used swimming costume it scratches the tops of my legs and fills with bubbles of water when I go in the sea. But I'm not in the sea. I'm sitting on a big striped towel shivering. My dad is sitting beside me and I'm thinking how hairy his legs are like gorilla seats. Then I notice something, a hollow in the soft bulge of his calf, big enough to cup an egg in. Not hairy like the rest, but dull, pinkish, fuzzy, like newborn mouse food. I want to put my finger inside and feel, but I don't. Somehow I know I can't do that and that I must not mention it. Then dad gets up and hobbles down the shingle towards the sea. Right? So this, uh, yeah, uh, this, this kind of goes on. I'll, I'll skip this bit and just read this to you. It wasn't until my father died, 
about 20 years later that the seaside moment came back to me. Only then did it occur to me that the hollow in his leg was a scar of a tropical ulcer contracted during the war. He was one of the soldiers captured by the Japanese when Singapore was taken in 1941. Right? And, and then she talks about how deep an area of silence this, this whole memory was and so on. But the reason I'm, I'm sort of uh, you know, drawing on this example is to tell you how rich a uh, resource memory can be. And to look at details from the past that may not have seemed important to you back then, but which in retrospect, as an adult or as someone who's, who's got some years behind them now, when you look back, you know that it was of some significance. Yeah. So pulling out that little detail and unknotting it is also a very, very important tool for the writing of a good story. Yeah. So I'll stop here and over now to uh, Maya. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Srilata. I found it fascinating because I cannot write fiction for nuts. I am one of those who can only write about uh, uh, things that happened, facts, events, which is probably why I'm going to be talking about the journalistic aspect of it. Um, I don't really have a slide in the sense, I, I will be bringing up uh, some information for you to uh, see as you, to just to kind of a clarity. But uh, one of the things that struck me is when you're talking about a story, we generally talk about it in the sense of it's fictional, right? A story is something that we've probably heard when we were young, we have been fond of stories. It's always been something fantastic, something uh, that is built up. And why do we actually use the term news story? Because when we think about news, do we really think of it as something fictional, something fantastic, something where, you know, um, fish fly and, uh, uh, you know, do we really think about that? Not at all, right? Then why is it called a news story? Can anyone, now that we are only in a Zoom meeting, can somebody uh, say why? Why do you think we would use the term story along with news? Anyone want to guess? If you don't want to speak, you can always use the chat box. Uh, I think because it also, with every news, there is a story behind it. So a story does not necessarily have to be fictional in the sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It can also be a non-fictional thing. And I think with every uh, news article or, or anything that is published, there is always a reason or there is always a plot. I mean, oh, okay. if you can, okay. use, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but I think that kind of makes it a story. And that's okay. my perspective. Thanks, Abhishek. That's a good one. So you are saying it's an account of something. So in that sense, it's perhaps a story, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So fantastic. That's a good answer. Would anyone like to chip in or do we just go on? Okay. So Abhishek is partly right in the sense that we think about it as an account of something, right? So if I have to talk about, say, uh, luckily it didn't happen, but this is an example that uh, I use. So Harichandana, Harichandana says, is it because news conveys things with massive detail? They give the feeling of a scenario as if the reader is in the scene. Yeah, that too. So this is what kind of brings me to what, uh, um, I mean, uh, Srilata described. We call it a news story also because there's a clear structure to it. There is a structure. So there is a beginning. There is a body. So there's a way we have to begin a story. Then there is a way in which we proceed. And then there's a way to conclude. And this, when it comes to news story, is very different to the way you would actually think about a normal story. Now, I'll give you an example. This is something that I use often, but I think... Uh, this kind of sums up very well when we talk about a new story. This didn't happen. But let us say this uh, evening when I was coming back from office, I witnessed an accident. Okay. So when I come home, say a dinner table conversation, or I meet a friend, or I'm telling somebody in the family, how would I describe it? I probably start off by saying, you know what happened today? I was coming and then I saw this van. There was this guy walking down, guy or a girl walking down the pavement. Then this van lost control. It rammed into the uh, median and then it climbed onto the pavement. And then 
And then they'll keep saying, then what? Then what? What happened? Oh, I don't know. I saw ambulances when I had to leave because I was getting late. I don't know. This is the way I would tell this. This is how I would recount, right? But what happens when you see the next day, newspaper, you don't read any of this. I mean, I've been an eyewitness, but that's not what you read. It starts off with the most important detail. It says that uh, so-and-so either has been injured or um, has, been, uh, has been killed in an accident and this is what happened. And then they don't go around saying, uh, yeah, they may say eyewitnesses said, but usually you have a police. Uh, you have a policeman, you have the official account. And that is really what makes a news story. So what I'm trying to point out here is when we use the word news story, the story here refers to a structure. Now, there are many ways of telling a news story, and I'll get to that um, in a while. But the most um, what would accepted, most accepted worldwide way of telling a news story is what we call the right news in what we say is the inverted pyramid style. So I'm just going to share the screen just so you can see this particular slide. So it will probably make uh, more sense to you. So where am I? Yeah. So you see this? So this is how it is. So what we have in the top, you know, you'll see there is the first paragraph and then it goes on to have a body. So what you have right on top is what we call the lead. Now the Americans spell it as L-E-D-E. -E. Now I'm very much into the um, British spellings and stuff like that. So I'm using it as LED. So LED is what sums up the event. So if you're talking about breaking news or if you're talking about an accident like this, a crime news, you're talking about political news, anything. So you have a summary right on top and then you go to the body of story. Now, the reason why we call it inverted pyramid is because the most important is right on top and the least important is at the bottom. Now, why this made sense? Why do you think this would have even made sense? Why would I, why can't I go chronological? Why do I have to worry about what is the most important and put it right on top and then kind of go around, go about putting details in descending order of importance? Anyone would like to take a guess? I think maybe because a person who's reading the news article for him, the story is not as important as the details. So he or she might want to know immediately that what actually happened, like the facts, and then mm -hmm. might not be that interested in knowing the story behind it. So maybe that's why the important details comes first. And then. Yeah. Thanks, Abhishek. That's a very good answer. Yes. That's one reason, but there's another reason as well. And the other reason is imagine how newspapers were made earlier. I mean, now of course you have this digitalization and you can actually read quite a bit on the screen. But earlier there was thick space. You know, I have actually worked in a newspaper when newspapers were manually made. So what happens then is you have only a limited space, but the reporter does not know what space is available. So the reporter collects all the details and writes the story and arranges these details in descending order of importance. And what happens is when there is no space, they chop from the bottom. So the least important aspect or the least important detail is left out of the story. The story is not affected at all. You still get the essence of it. So which is why the inverted pyramid style became extremely popular. So when I say it seems kind of very easy to say, okay, put the most important fact first, but then there is a structure to that as well. And that is you have the most crucial information right on top, you have the support of information, and then you have other details which might actually be repetitive as well. So for instance, you might have the crucial information in the case of the example that I gave you of an accident, you might have details about who died or who was injured, et cetera, uh, when, where, the supportive information would be what the police sources say because they are the authoritative uh, source here. And then the repetitive information is what an eyewitness said. So that is the way you construct the story. Now, let me let us say that I don't have space. When I make page, I find that there is no space. 
to actually put the, all the details in. And I cut from the bottom. So the repetitive information is left out. You still have the crucial information. You have the supportive information. So that is the reason why this inverted pyramid style became very acceptable. So what is, how do I actually put the crucial information? So again, there is a very easy way of going about it. We say put the five W's and a H. So what are the five W's? Those, so the five W's are who, what, where, when, why. So it could be in the case of, forget what is here than this, but in the case of the accident, now who died? So in this case, I may not know who died or who was injured, so a pedestrian, right? Sometimes when you want to add a little more detail and if you want to kind of uh, evoke some sympathy, you say a grandmother, right? So that way you say, oh my God, an old lady was walking and then she was it. Or you say a uh, father of two children. You know, something like that. Or you say um, a homeless person. So, you know, you can kind of add a little bit of detail there because just saying that, giving a name, say Maya or something like that, nobody would know who it is, right? So you can, you, in order to make it more relatable, so that is the way the who is. And then what? So what here would be exactly what was the person doing? So um, why... In the sense, in this case, was probably walking down the uh, a street. And then where did this happen? Of course, very important. Uh, when did it happen? And why is it? Why did it happen? So in this case, it is given in a slightly different uh, context. So this is also about a journalist trying to answer the five W's and a H while writing a story. Okay, and this again in the, is in the uh, context of online journal uh, publishing. I'll get to digital journalism in a bit. But if you're talking about, uh, you know, the way that um, traditional journalism has always reported stuff, it has been based on the first paragraph, that is the lead containing the vital information, which we say is 5W and a H and then supporting, you provide supporting information and then you go down. So there is a hierarchy here that you build. So you decide what is the most important and then what is the least important and ensure that the least important comes right at the bottom. So if you have to do that then, you have to have all the facts collected. So if you're looking at um, something in the context of what Professor Srilata said earlier, memory is important for a journalist too. Sometimes there are uh, instances where you can't be seen even jotting down with a pen and a paper or recording stuff because you don't want to be known as a journalist collecting information, in which case you do rely on your memory. Memory is important because you, the more details you have, the better your story is, especially now when everyone seems to be in a race. So when you're talking about breaking news, you see uh, what happens when you kind of uh, scroll through channels on television. It seems to be breaking in every channel you know. But then there is a race. So each channel is trying to add, every reporter is trying to add something to the story that the other channel does not have. So all the channels have the story, but then not all of them have all the details. So now here the race is for those details. Sometimes it's very innocuous. Our uh, silly, outright silly. I remember when this actress, uh, Sri Devi, died. I mean, the Tamasha was, uh, I, I think there was more on TV than what it actually happened. People were trying to recreate that scene in the bathroom with somebody lying in the bathtub and saying, this is how she should have been, etc. Now, the reason, I mean, I'm not supporting it, but you can see what the reason behind it is. Because you want to score against your competition and you're trying to add details. So the more details you have, the better it is. But then how do I really select something? Now, how do I make this choice? Or again, to relate to what uh, Professor Srilata said earlier, how do I identify material? Now, not everything becomes a story. Now, you and me might actually encounter something that's very interesting to us. But that doesn't make it to the newspapers or to television. Uh, maybe somebody writes a blog about it, or maybe you write a blog about it, but then it doesn't really enjoy that uh, popularity of, say, something, you don't really call it a news. 
So what makes news? How do I really decide that something is newsworthy? So that is a term here. So when we say newsworthiness, uh, earlier, say, I think prior to the 1970s or so, nobody really went to a journalism school to learn journalism. Usually you would find people who are, um, say, graduates in any field, but they can write decently. And uh, you, the term that they would say is you have a nose for the news. That is, you seem to instinctively know what is news. And then they kind of write about it. And we used to make jokes in the newsroom about it as well. So it is news sense. So if you want to uh, make fun of somebody, you say you are a news sense, you have great news sense. So, you know, punning on that nuisance word. But if you're looking at it, there is a structured way of deciding what makes news. How do we decide news worthiness? So here's the slide. And there are any number of uh, versions as to what makes news. I'm just kind of giving you some general ones. So timing, right? Something that happens now is more important than something that happened several years ago or even uh, yesterday. So you say there's nothing as old as yesterday's newspaper because you're really no longer interested. And now I think you don't, shouldn't even be talking in terms of newspaper, at least that was 24 hours a day, you were updated once in a day. But now you're talking about updates every hour or minute. So the timing is important. Something that happens now is definitely important. Significance, so what does it hold? Now, you can have something that happened several years ago, and that could actually make news. And right now, that is happening. We are celebrating the 75th year of independence. So people are actually compiling what happened, all those important milestones that the country has crossed, and that becomes news. So significance, proximity. I am definitely interested in knowing what's happening in India first what's happening in Sri Lanka because I'm in a Southern state. So I want to know what's happening because anything that happens there could affect me. I'm interested in what is happening in the neighborhood, Pakistan. And I'm also happen interested in what's happening in the US, right? But am I interested as much in what's happening in uh, Australia? Perhaps not, unless it is really momentous and maybe the Indian team is playing to get there against the Australian team and you want to know. But if you're looking at, uh, uh, proximity, definitely. And something that happens closer home is important because it's likely to affect us. Right? So proximity. And then there's another kind of proximity as well. Not just the physical proximity, emotional proximity. You seem to identify with a few uh, cultures and so you are emotionally proximate. In a way, I think whether we like it or not, we are tied to the UK because of a colonial past. So if there is some kind of a proximity. People still seem to be interested in what's happening there. Uh, the U.S., of course, for a different reason. Then if you think about Pakistan, Bangladesh, etc., we're all part of the subcontinent. There is some cultural uh, similarity there we share with them. So there is that as well. Then prominence. Now, for instance, I think the best way to understand this is I think the day that 9-11 happened, you know, when those uh, planes uh, flew into the Twin Towers, I don't think there was a single news channel or newspaper in the world that didn't have it on page one. Now, it didn't matter whether they were in that, that they, they enjoyed that proximity or whatever that we talked about. But this was something beyond imagination, prominent. So you found that world over the next day, or even when it was happening, this was in the news. And then human interest. Now, that's quite fascinating. People always ask me, why do you always end these news stories, especially if you watch television? The last uh, segment, you know, uh, would be something that is heartwarming, like, say, somebody helping somebody or a cat um, caught in a, it's tangled in some wires and people trying to get the cat, rescue the cat, doing something nice. Why do you do that? Human interest stories have a certain appeal. And even otherwise, news is always negative. Everybody is complaining. Oh, the newspapers can't say anything nice. I mean, they're not supposed to say anything nice. They are not uh, propaganda organs. They are supposed to point out what is wrong. But then ending it with a nice human interest stories, you know, especially if it's a night bulletin, 
you feel, okay, fine, all is right in the world. It's all right. There are some problems. They'll be fixed. That's all right. And that is the way you think about it. Competition. Now, I think much of the problems, much of the criticisms that uh, news faces is because of competition. I mean, think about the number of news channels and, uh, and I mean, channels, not just television. We have news outlets. It's amazing. Nobody ever thought that we would come to this. And what this has also made is this um, meaningless race you know, where everyone, so people say something, then they detract, and then they try to kind of set things in order. It's, it's a total mess. And I think it's also because of the competition. So we're always trying to find that one detail which will set us ahead of the rest. Impact. Impact is, okay, what is the effect of this news? Now, if I write about something, for instance, I write about corruption somewhere, right? Do you think that people will take notice and act on it? Do you think that people should know that? So what impact is it likely to create? Novelty. Now, this is why I say um, uh, bad news is good news, actually. Because something that is not ordinary, then it, it kind of, that, that is novelty, and that makes news. It need not necessarily be um, something good, right? Uh, for instance, I remember this particular uh, incident simply because there was one report which is very funny. They had talked about a train that arrived at its scheduled time 24 hours later. So it was to come at nine o'clock the previous day and it arrived at nine the next day. And this made news. So obviously, the train is usually on time, but then that particular day it arrived just 24 hours later. And so, you know, there was something new about it and there was and drama. My God, who doesn't love drama? We love all the emotions. We love all the things that go ahead. With. So these are some of the factors. So when you think about uh, what makes news, it is not just one aspect. It will probably, the event will probably take a few of these. You know, so it, it would probably be prominent, significant. It will involve celebrities, so it becomes um, interesting, then there is proximity, it has just happened, so there's timing there. So you'll find that most often there are a few elements, not just one. So this is really what makes a, uh, something newsworthy. So ordinary events don't seem to enjoy that. So that is what it is. So the type of story writing, there are several ways of writing, which is why I said um, at the start, the inverted pyramid style is the most popular. But you should also understand with digitization and with no longer those kind of pressures that the newspapers have, the inverted story style is not really that popular. But when you think about stories, there is the straight news and then there is a feature story. So a straight news story would actually tell what happened. So it was the accident, right? But a feature kind of says how, why it happened. So in this case of the accident, it will probably a feature will be on the poor condition of roads perhaps, or lack of signage, or no light there, or something like that. So that becomes a feature. So a feature is usually not just about one incident, but you'll be talking about a number of issues. So for instance, if I were to do a story now, and I think it was in this morning's news about Chennai Corporation wanting to repair something like 250 kilometers of roads before the mountains. That's a feature story. I mean, I could make it a straight news story saying that Chennai Corporation in a press release said that they have conducted a survey and they have decided that 250 kilometers of roads have to be relayed. That would be a straight news. But I could make it into a feature. Now, why are the roads in such bad condition? What happened? Is it because they were dug up constantly or is it because that they were not laid properly in the first place? Or is it because uh, there's been development along the side, encroachments, et cetera, and the road has been damaged? So here lies the story. So this is a feature. So feature says how people involved are also reacting. It discusses the impact of news. So, so there are different ways of writing. Now, I said one of the things is, you know, beating the competition, and that is probably responsible for many of the um, criticisms that today's media face. 
So one of the things is how do I keep the uh, reader interested? So you have to kind of provide a twist, yeah? And you can kind of play with it in the sense of you localize, you create a relationship so you can localize a national story. So you could have, say, for instance, uh, this happens all the time, I think, there are players, whether they are cricketers or uh, thing who are belong to different regions. So you kind of, they might have won something and then you go to their place, their village they come from, or you speak to their friends and you create a story. You're trying to localize a national story. You can also do the reverse, nationalize a local story. So you could have somebody who is successful here and you're looking at people like that in other areas. You can do that as well. And then you can juxtapose, you embrace your inner contrarian. I mean, I kind of uh, could help smile at this word contrarian. I think of myself as one. But you're kind of looking at different aspects. You ask, why not? You know, you just turn it around. You personalize big data. That personalization is something that usually clicks with the reader. They like it when somehow you draw them into the story rather than present bland facts, you know. And then you reinvent the holiday story. So these are all ways in which you can actually uh, add a you know, twist. You can hook the reader. But that said, I must also say that you first have to decide who your readers are. Now, this is the most fascinating thing in a newspaper uh, or in any media outlet. You have a vague idea of who the reader is. But you have no clue that is who the reader is. Now, when I was working as a journalist, um, I was with the Indian Express Chennai. And then, of course, our competitor at that time was the Hindu. So the, what we thought or who we thought we were writing to were people who did not, um, who were not as formal as the Hindu reader, uh, who liked a little bit of drama, who was more casual in their approach to life, uh, who were, I mean, okay, if I can put it in very plain things, we talked of the Hindu reader as somebody really stuck up and Indian Express readers were very interested. So this is the image we had in our heads when we were actually writing. And I think it may not be so. I don't think, uh, you know, Hindu readers were stuck up. I later started reading the Hindu also. I don't think that is the case, but then you do write for an imaginary reader and that decides the way you actually approach your style. So that is really what it is. But in another way, it is not just the writing style. How do you frame the news? Now, what is framing? Uh, if I have to put it in very pedestrian terms, what does a frame do? Now, if you think about a photograph, what does a frame do? The frame basically tells you what you should focus on. What should you focus on? The picture inside the frame, not the wall outside the frame. Right? So that is what the business of the frame is. So when you're framing a story, what do you do? You give it a certain perspective. And this is where all the charges of bias um, no, being um, subject, all that comes in. Because the frame you choose is what gives the reader the impression that you're slanting towards one viewpoint than the other. So framing becomes very important. Now, when you become a researcher, I mean, I moved from being a journalist to a media studies researcher. One of the ways in which media studies researchers uh, looked at news is through the frames. What kind of frames were used? Whose voice were you reflecting? Right? So these are some of the issues that uh, make the whole thing very interesting. And then finally, I think uh, this whole uh, thing about digital storytelling. Now, uh, I don't think we can actually look at digital storytelling as just putting online whatever you would normally write. And then that is not going to be a success at all because for one, you have to think about how people read, where people read, why people read, how people read. I mean, all the W's and H here too. Because if I have to read one very long rambling story on the small mobile screen, I'm sure I'm just going to kind of get away midway. Not, not possible. So you will have to, when you're thinking about digital storytelling, you have to take into account the... Um, 
median here. So the median here is either your laptop screen, which I think now is a kind of uh, not as popular as say a mobile uh, phone screen. So you have to look at that. The next is how do people find the story? I mean, there are so many options. So you have to start thinking about keywords. You have to think about clickbait. Not a great thing, especially when you find that the article has no relevance to the title. I mean, I've clicked on n number of articles that seem to promise so much in the title, but when you actually read it, it's something you knew already, there's nothing in it. So those kind of strategies to draw the attention of the reader. And then um, how do you optimize your digital story? Do you really have pictures to go with it? How do you um, gauge people's interests? And again, this whole question again and again, as to who's the reader? Unless I think I have a fair idea of who the reader is, it's going to be very difficult for me to actually um, uh, have a style or come up with a way in which to reach the reader. So these are some things that play a very important role and uh, I mean, role in writing uh, a new story. So if you're thinking about the similarities with a fiction or a creative element, I think many of the things that uh, Professor Srilata said are valid here as well. Uh, details. Now, again and again, I keep stressing on the details because you can convey a lot through the details. Now, what are you trying to imply? So when you think about a new story, it doesn't explain everything. It seems to rely on the fact that the reader is quite intelligent and knows something prior. Right? So what, what details do you include and what do you leave out? And that is equally important. right? And then, of course, you can't afford to pause because you're in a race here. You're trying to kind of beat the competition. So you're on your toes all the time. But then I think you're also in a way you're building the world for the reader. I mean, how do we know about the world around us? It's only through these uh, you know, news media. I have not been to Africa, but I have a certain image of Africa. And if I kind of think about where did I get it from? And it is probably because I've heard certain things said in the news. No, that is really so you are in a world creating the world for the reader in a way creating the world for the reader so i think i'll stop here and open it for uh, open the floor for questions and discussion thank you thank you dr maya and thank you dr Shilata, and thank you maya for also slight promotion of indian express very subtly <laughs> even after so many years of leaving the service <laughs> and the Hindu bashing. So. No, 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 no. I said it was then. See, at the <laughs> time that I worked it, and just to put it in context, that was a clear 20, 25 years ago. So the world is a very different place now. The newspapers are very different to what they were. And now I read the Hindu, if that makes it any better. <laughs> okay, so folks, which we are open to questions, you can unmute, ask. I mean, if you're going to unmute and ask, just raise your hand so that you can go in some order. Otherwise, it gets very chaotic. Or you can put it in the chat box. Yes, Anya Raja, go ahead. Um, hi, Ms. Uh, Maya, and uh, hi, Ms. Sheelata. Greatly enjoyed uh, today's session on storytelling. Um, I was, in fact, uh, thank you, Mr. Sanjeev, for... <laughs> Uh, clarifying your uh, clarifying Ms. Maya's take on the Indian Express because I was just about to ask her what she would categorize me as now because I read both the Times and the Hindu. <laughs> yeah, well, I think my uh, being stuck up would be balanced by my uh, sort of uh, slight desire for gossip early in the morning, but uh, masked by clever Times in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, so Ms. Sheila, it's a great pleasure to meet you because, well, I've been look, really looking forward to talking to you and I look forward to reading your uh, piece every, every weekend in the Hindu supplement. So my question to you would be, um, yeah, so my question is directed to you, which is that, so how much import do you sort of attach to a person's view of your piece. Uh, I'm sure as a writer, you would have been encountered with cases of criticism a lot, um, exhaustively over the years. So how much of an import and how much of, um, let's say, 
how much of um yeah how much of an import would you attach to a person's uh, criticism because you know um as i'd like to quote rumi here who says uh, the heart is the sea and language is the shore sure so whatever is in a sea hits the shore and people may not not everybody looks at not everybody looks at the beach in the same way and it, in sort of in that context what you feel like um what you feel like has to be written a certain way for uh you to express your take on your feelings yeah yeah i get it I, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah okay yeah yeah i get your question um yeah so i i think i've learned with a uh, time and age uh to just write the things that i think i should write um and i think there's a way in which if you've done something for a for some years you know instinctively that this feels right right it feels right it feels honest and i'm using the word honesty in a very broad way i'm not i'm not just talking about don't lie that kind of thing but what feels right to you that needs to be said as a story or as a column piece or a poem or whatever it may be right uh, and it may not go down well as you said it may not go down with everybody and uh, there may be people who are perhaps critical of you they may make you misunderstand you or whatever but i think um I, I I've learned now not to uh, worry too much about that. Uh, what I do, what I think matters to me, though, uh, you know, is uh, the opinion of people uh, who I think of as really good writers and good readers themselves. Then if they sort of sometimes write to me and say, you know, hello, this this didn't quite work, and we don't quite agree with you. then yeah, i mean it might uh i think it's not upsetting me nowadays but i but i would take that feedback very seriously right uh but you know you still have to at the end of the day go out and write your story and say what you have to do and live your life the way you want so that's i think you need to one needs to sort of develop that that sense of equanimity i think it's not easy but uh, it comes up yeah. and move this out so perfect much. yeah thank you thank you anya and thank you shilika uh, we have a question from ashwat ashwat you can mute or and feel free to turn on your video because these are going to be your professors you should let them get a more personal feel uh, hello ma'am ashwat so from attending this webinar uh, i realized how important it is to improve our observation skills so i would like to know if uh, observation skills are this uh, is this born with you or uh, is there any way to improve it like practice and all why do you want to take it what ma'am no, i'm just asking if uh, it's a maya yeah. i should i think it is very important for the um, i think even otherwise observation is very important because everything depends on your ability to note these details and i mean when i say everything i don't just mean the writing part even um now when you're thinking about analysis when uh, you're thinking about drawing conclusions so i think you do based on observation now is there any way to improve it as i think one exercise would be to actually as professor shrilata said pause take stock of where you are what you're doing at any given moment uh, moment see what is happening but the other thing i would say is uh, if it comes to journalism there's so much you can convey by just putting down what you observe and not really commenting that would act as a commentary now for instance if uh, i can give you an example one of the stories that i worked on it was uh, now i think i can talk safely about it this was a campaign we were to, we sent on a campaign trail of the aadmk uh, and i i think there was a journalist who was covering that i was in tiruvannamalai for a totally different reason which was to look at the marriages between foreigners and locals in tiruvannamalai now that was my story now when i land there what happens is the whole play of place is chaotic because chief minister jayalalitha is landing there and so i can't even book myself into a hotel and i had to kind of get my photographer to vacate his room 
go stay with a friend and choose his room and that was how it was so i became very friendly with that owner that lodge owner and he was telling me i mean as i was leaving in search of these uh, foreigners who have supposedly married locals and deserted them or living with them we don't know what it was i was when i was leaving i mean just your small talk he told me you know what i'm just going to go down to see the hotel that has been ready for jalalita would you like to come with me and then i said i don't think i'll be allowed as a journalist he said of course not but i can take you as my sister in law so his wife was a very quiet lady i don't know how anybody would have made the connection between the two of us you know we didn't look as look like sisters or whatever but this was too good an opportunity to miss so i did go it was solely observation i mean i couldn't ask questions because i can't make them uh, curious about who i was i had to remain quiet like his wife did so but it was only that and what i observed or what i noted down was the fact that uh, there were several things you know she had got the if she was staying only for one night uh, she had changed the upholstery uh, the screens everything had to be changed to her favorite color of cream you had an ac installed in the uh, toilet and bathroom so it was these kind of things that made the story so in the end what i wrote was exactly what i saw no comment necessary i didn't say oh here is a person who has spent so much for one day or who has demanded i mean there was a pdx system that was involved in the that was a thing and mind you lot of pay was paid to the hotel it was the it was an honor to host the uh, chief minister kind of a thing i made no comment i just wrote that and it is for the reader to make that you know you uh, add to and to and make 4 or 40 that's up to you so i think observation is very important and i would say it is the same uh, in when i work as a researcher as well now when i kind of uh, uh, analyze those videos of say uh, i don't know, people are probably wondering why i'm putting myself through this arnab goswami whatever it is observation the way he says the way he says certain words his actions his body language that is really what helps you draw some of the conclusions that you do yeah thank you dr maya i hope that answer is satisfactory as well Yes, Actually, sir. it would be interesting to also, I mean, I'd like to point out to the panelists that the group that is participating here is a mix of CDS, uh, SAS, Arts and Science and Computing Data Science, and like Ashwath here has actually applied for BALLB. So, you know, even from writing perspective, observation perspective, how it would differ, you know, maybe somebody ends up being a technical journalist or things like that, if we could add towards the end after we take the questions. Um, so next question, we have a question from Shabanti. Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, I was basically, I'm really interested by what you guys were saying, but um, I do have a few questions about your respective fields. But um, first of all, it was like I was a bit curious about the um, class structures. So um, I'm really into like literature specifically, but I was wondering how do you balance between the two fields? of certainly there's like amount of actually literary content that needs to be analyzed, like, you know, the motifs and the themes and coursework on that area. Um, how do you balance that between like that and the actual creative writing portion during like semesters and terms is what I was wondering. Okay, so is this, a, I think this is a broader <clears throat> curricular co uh, question, uh, Shabuki. Um, and uh, well, let me try and answer it in my own way. And I think Professor Maya may have more things to offer because she's been here longer. Uh, it's a good question, and it's a question I've often asked myself because I'm both a writer and an academic, and I'm and a teacher. So how do you really balance this, the creative element, in terms of actually writing your way through something and receiving it as a text that's already in your hands, and then? Analyzing it in terms of motifs or themes or symbols or whatever, right? So that's the question. Uh, I think, in fact, the former, you know, being able to figure out how a text gets written when you do it yourself, when you try to uh, actually create a literary text yourself, gives you a very good insight, gives you a very solid insight into the text that comes to you already handed down, right? 
And I think therefore it's important to see these two things uh, in a connected way and not to, uh, as it often happens in academia, to see them as very separate themes to say, okay, so-and-so is a writer, they do a very different thing and so-and-so is a prop who teaches. Right? So I think that's, that's sort of an unfortunate thing and I'm really hoping, uh, I think that will not, I think, happen at Sai University. Hopefully we'll be able to bridge that which I think is one, one, one thing. So that's, I don't know if that helps, but I'm sure Maya will have more things to say. Yeah, I think uh, exactly what you said, but I also think, see, I've also been on two different sides. Like I've, I've been a writer, I've been a journalist, and now I move to the other side where I analyze what others write. Uh, I think both feed into each other. I don't see them as separate. I mean, if you are very closed and you think you create the best content and we all kind of have those phases. And I can say that when I was a journalist, I really didn't think I could better myself or, you know, I thought, okay, what I was writing was fine. I didn't think of myself as having a bias or of being subjective or anything like that. But when you move to the other side, you see that a little more clearly. And I think that makes you a better creator and especially in literature as well. I think, I mean, one of the things which I think all of us say is in order to write well, you have to read, read, read. So you have to write in order to create something. I think you also have to know what others are doing and how they are doing it. And I see this as interconnected, not so much as two very distinct processes that have nothing to do with each other. If that answers the question. Uh, yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, I have a second question. This one is like a bit more vague. So um, you can ask me because I'm not exactly sure I'm going to put this the right way. So I was wondering in like both of your um, respective fields, ma'am, um, it's definitely like very prevalent in news, but I also like wonder it a lot when I'm writing like stories and stuff. So for most publishing firms or news firms, you, there's a certain like overarching view that a company will have or like a certain publishing firm will have and there's also a certain view you have and the public will have so how do you balance between what you know the public wants to hear what you have a moral obligation you feel you need to report about or write about and what do you feel that the publisher or company sees you because there's like definitely a certain balance because it's not necessarily you can just publish everything there's certain expectations that need to be met and I was wondering is that a big problem in like your respective fields or if it is do you guys like have to combat that in a certain way see I think the answer now is uh, we're actually getting into theoretical areas one of the things are uh, what you're talking about Um, Professor Maya, you're, you. you, uh, you've sorry. been muted. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, so I think we are kind of moving into a, theoret a theoretical uh, aspect here. So what I would call public interest. So one of the questions that journalists uh, ask themselves is how do they act in public interest? So the public interest is not divided, I mean, defined as something the public is interested in. The public is usually interested in pornography. Now, is it the journalist business to actually give them that? Not. But then if you start making decisions for the uh, public, like, no, 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 you can't really have that. Then you have to only read about, uh, say, political democracy and things like that. Then you're turning the public completely away. They're not going to buy your paper. They're not going to watch your news. They're gonna, not going to read your blog because... You're so preachy and you're trying to stuff things down their throat. So it's a kind of balance. Now, this is where I think papers like, I don't know, I think it was Tanya who said she reads Times of India. People are very critical of Times of India and things like that. But I think they are somewhere trying that balance, perhaps not succeeding, maybe leaning towards one more than the other, more towards the page three, etc. But unless you have that, I don't think you can hold the public interest. And now, if I mean, interest of the public, sorry. And the other thing also we have to remember is, see, people are spoiled for choice. I mean, it's not like you just had a couple of papers. Now, when I worked, as I told you, the only competitor was Hindu, and we only had to be worried about that. But people who work now, the journalists, I really pity them. Because not only are they competing with different newspapers, they are competing with social media. They're competing with different forms of media. They're competing with television. So there is this thing about how do I hold the reader's interest? How do I draw the reader's interest? So these are big challenges. And I think uh, 
journalist who's working now will probably be able to talk about it because as I said, I come from a different time. Um, but then we would we would have some interesting columns, etc., to draw the reader in. And people bought, bought Indian Express for uh, because you had these light uh, reading also. So each uh, media outlet, I think, has a different strategy to attract what they think are is their market. So that's what I said. We have to define the market. So we are competing, yes, but we also think our readers are slightly different from, say, the competitors' readers. Yeah, so I don't know the way I, I think I completely agree with what Maya just said. Uh, it is a very hard, delicate balance, uh, right? And I think also as a writer, I think, you know, the you do have that a little bit of luxury to make a sort of a personal choice about this. And I don't think journalists would necessarily have that because in a sense, journalists, especially if they're affiliated with a certain news agency, what to sort of... That the work of balancing can be, I think, harder. But if you're a writer, and if you're a writer who's not looking to make money off one's writing, I mean, if you have a day job, right? Or if you tell yourself, look, I mean, what matters to me is whatever, very broadly defined your writerly integrity or your artistic integrity, then you might make a slightly different choice. The balance may tilt a little bit more towards what you want to say than what the publishing firm wants to publish or what's going to make for a best selling novel or a, or a like whatever, like for instance, the form that I write most often poetry, it doesn't sell. I mean, I I, I cannot live off those lines, right? Um, it's only very recently that my publisher, my poetry publisher, actually sent sent me a royalty check. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's just impossible. I mean, it won't. It's not going to feed anybody, right? So I think, in a sense, I I'm just thinking about it now. I think I it used to really annoy me in the past, but I think now it's. Um, it gives me a certain freedom because I, I don't need, I, I'm not dependent on it to make a living. So then I, in a sense, I'm free to sort of uh, say what I say within the limits of, of course, decorum and all of that, right? I mean, certain things I think are still things that you should not, uh, I mean, you have a duty to, I think, the readers and so on to also to write about certain things. And uh, they may be difficult things. They may be hard truths that you want your reader to see. They may be unpopular truths. But uh, I think sometimes you just might want to make a choice. Too. I don't know if this helps, but I think it's coming at it from a slightly different angle. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's a really brave statement. Uh, yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, we have Abhishek. You can go ahead. Um, good evening, ma'am. It was an amazing lecture. And uh, you had me caught onto it for the entire time. I think very interesting. So thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us. My question is directed to Maya, ma'am. And uh, it would be, what do you think from your perspective is currently lacking in the media sector, which could possibly be an untapped field, but has maybe a great potential, especially um, kind of, directing towards the field of digital media because uh, I think that this question comes for me is that as a BTEC student, I'm also interested in, let's say, contributing something to this field as well. So for example, there is this newsletter called Morning Brew, which uh, you subscribe to and then you receive a mail every day in the morning in your inbox, which kind of gives news which is tailored to your interests, but also in a humorous way. So I think like that from, because you have had such a long experience, what do you think is kind of an untapped field in media and, and how do you think we can possibly uh, do it? So that's my question. Abhishek, if I knew that, I would have actually started an enterprise and made money <laughs> and become very popular. <laughs> I think the issue here is, uh, see, what we find is also that everything seems to have a very short life. You know, whether you talk about your Instagram, whether you talk about all these social media outlets, everything seems to have a very short life. And because your technology is evolving so rapidly that it is, it, these spaces, you know, um, 
there are more and more spaces when people just keep moving. Now, when uh, the dot com boom started in 2000, nobody really thought that it is just going to die out in a few years, but it did. So I remember there was a lot of people who were writing obituaries for traditional dominant, uh, you know, those legacy media as we call it now, but it didn't happen. They found ways to survive as well. And I remember the first newspapers that went online, they just reproduced what was in the printed edition there, but then they learned to compete and then they learned to adapt to different ways, things like that. So I don't know if this has an answer because you can only try different things it will probably succeed for a while and then you will have to evolve along with technology and move on to other things. So I don't think there's an enterprise where you can set up and say, okay, for the next 10 years, I'm safe. And this is going to succeed. Or maybe to phrase that question a bit differently. I mean, you've answered this question, but another question that pops up is, what do you feel like something that needs to be addressed, but uh, which has not yet been done? Like, like something in media that, or some aspect in media that you have felt that this kind of uh, approach to this would be good or, or talking about this would be better, maybe for society or maybe even as a great commercial, it has a great commercial aspect to it, but it it hasn't been done due to many reasons. So, I Okay, I wouldn't um, preach at all because I understand why the media is doing what it is doing. And I also understand very well that right now it is a business. So to kind of talk about what it should do, I think is not quite right. Because the whole thing has changed. If you look at the media uh, landscape, the ownership patterns, uh, competition. Now, what is news itself has changed. I mean, I gave you very broadly the news values, et cetera. But right now, what is news is something else altogether. So for instance, uh, why would you want to watch a Nayantara wedding on Netflix? But that seems to be so popular. So the whole thing has changed. So for us to basically say something is lacking or this is what should be done, no, I would hesitate. I mean, I would not get into that at all because I think uh, there are two ways of looking at it. One is you can look at, it, look at it from the perspective of the markets. So basically, we are given what we as readers or viewers want. So if, for instance, nobody watched, uh, say, the Nayantara uh, Vignesh, uh, whatever his name is, Children's Wedding on Netflix, Netflix will not come up with something like this again. But the fact is there are people who are actually doing it. They are watching it. And that is the reason why these things are popular. So in a way, we have to take the blame for whatever we are finding fault with the media. We don't read long pieces. Now, we don't want to read a long news story. Then why do we expect the media to provide that? If nobody is going to read it, what are they going to do that thing? So there are a lot of issues here, which is why I would stay away from that. But with regard to what will make a commercial success, I think people are already telling you what it is like uh, when you see what is happening in social media. They are doing it only because it is commercially successful. So I think that question is already answered. You can see that more and more people are latching on to this page three kind of thing. It's all about films. It's all about film stars. It's all celebrity culture. That's what is happening in your Instagram as well. So it's all because it is a commercial uh, success. I mean, who would even think, who would have thought about a couple of years ago that there would be something called influencers who can actually make money. I mean, when you look at it, so that, that is what I mean. I think I wouldn't kind of start preaching and say media must do this and not do that. I think I'm more into uh, understanding why the media is doing what it is doing. And again, not being extremely supportive in the sense of, yeah, this is how it should be known. But to understand what are the factors that influence the media and why is it come to what it has. Got it. Thanks a lot. I think that was a that was a really interesting answer. I think uh, you. when you actually talked about how we the people actually decide what the media 
has to offer is may it be in let's say different content formats or even the content itself we are the ones who are deciding what they should provide us with so i think that yeah. kind of but having said that i think they are the ones who give the choice as well i can only choose yeah. <laughs> based on what you give me right i can't ask for something that is not given to me yeah so yeah, yeah. it's a rather i think a complex issue but but thanks a lot for that answer my pleasure so i think tanya had a hand raised but she's been asking in the chat box tanya would you like to uh, unmute and ask or or is it been answered on the chat box and no sir it's being answered on the chat box okay great so then we have um, hari chandra and we are just for at one and a half hours mark so let's take some more questions and try to wrap up soon hari chandra good evening everyone uh, thank you for providing us with this interesting session and spending time with us uh, i have a few questions so the first one is uh, like all the people who write they have a different or unique style of writing like if you look at jk rowling she goes in depth with each and every character although there are plenty of them and she provides the personality of each and the thought of the main character and when you look at sudha murthy she goes about tradition and cultures and about her experiences with uh, various characters so this style of writing do we take inspiration from the other authors around or do we develop one with the practice of writing so uh, i think it's a bit of both as professor maya mentioned earlier uh, in answer to a, uh, in response to another question uh, unless you read you cannot write so i think there is that's very true so uh, i think what you have read also makes you as a writer but having said that i think it's really important that you commit to some kind of a regular writing practice so you develop your own voice and your own perspective on Uh, how to tell a story and uh, what to write about and all of it, right? Because uh, there is no point, uh, you know, sort of being a photocopy of another writer at the end of the day. Because your readers are going to figure out they're going to go to a Rowling, they're not going to come to you. So that is, you know, if you go to write about Hogwarts or you know some such similar thing, right? So I think that's really important. You need to uh, really own your own voice and to tell that tell your story from that perspective. That's the thing. and uh, my next question is how do you build uh, the tension like sub, uh, like these whatever we read is printed text so how do you build that kind of tension in which you feel like as a reader you feel that you are in the scenario like you are playing the main character but it should be like really subtle like so how do you build that so i think building tension or uh, actually see you know what really constitutes a dramatic moment right we often think that you know unless a man is being chased by a tiger or you know the villain is uh, like holding the heroine at gun point or kidnapped her or whatever some of we think of those as dramatic moments but if you think about it, it it's usually you know life is seen so smaller dramatic moments right so uh, i think for us to develop the sensitivity to to understand that it may be i mean it may be for instance uh, if you're standing in line in a parent teacher meeting as a parent then you have you sort of watch when i i'm mean, this kind of happened to me in the past you know you sort of in a in line and your child is probably not done very well in school or whatever so you've been called in by the principal or the class teacher and so on you're waiting in line outside and you find that the uh, parent or the mother who's gone just before you you know start uh, you know maybe comes out and she's got she's wiping a tear and then you know you can kind of imagine what has gone on there right that is that for me is a dramatic moment it's not the man who is being chased by a tiger right yeah so i think that's where the tension is you recognize that this is a point you know and you can actually weave the entire story around uh, maybe you don't know this woman and you're never going to get to know her but then it's possible if you think about it deeply to weave an entire story about her right so i think that's that's what i'm trying to get Oh, I know that answers your question. Okay, thank you for answering the questions so much. Thank you, Harshitna. So, if do we have any further questions? Let's we'll give a moment for that. Else, I think it's been a very fascinating session, and could wrap it up now because it's about been an hour and a half. So, anyone has any hesitation? Please, now is the last chance. Like. 
course, we will be having more such sessions in the coming weeks, so you will know, have other opportunities as well. No? Okay, then I think, uh, thank you, Professor Shilata and mine. And uh, uh, thank bye, you, everyone. Thank it's you. It's been a great pleasure interacting, and we do look forward to having you on uh, campus soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, really looking forward to meeting all of you. Thank you. Thank you.